Computational Audiology Network from complex models to clinical care, digital health and patient-centered outcomes. We start with a short introduction and also I have an ID for this meeting. And then if I introduce myself, I work as audiologist in Nijmegen. I started my training after a study of physics and I think during one of the courses I followed, I met Bert. He gave a course about signal processing in, in Delft. He was an invited lecturer. And ever since we stayed in touch, when I started thinking about computational audiology and using machine learning, Bert already knew the work by Dennis Barber by writing this uh, computational audiology perspective paper. I met uh, Dennis and I exchanged nice ideas about uh, the potential of active learning. And Joseph, we met each other for the VCCA last year via Tobias uh, Goring. I already had seen some of your work when we were writing this uh, computational audiology paper. And more recently, for a scoping review, we have looked into all the digital approaches or automated audiometry that have been published since uh, 2013. And I wondered uh, how many groups would be working on machine learning audiometry. And yeah, we found the three of you but we didn't find any other groups and now this scoping review has just been accepted and uh, published. And I thought it would be a great opportunity to yeah, talk with the three of you about what developments you further expect. And yeah, one of the reasons for me to write the scoping review was also to better understand the barriers. Why is it not used in the clinics yet? And how does it compare to other automated audiometry approaches. So that's briefly for me, the motivation to contact you. And I'm really glad that you all uh, replied positively. And so for this interview, I think with the questions and answers you already provided, we have enough to have to fill a block and to share thoughts of the potential and further developments. So having said that, maybe good Joseph, if you further introduce yourself and then Dennis and Bert can maybe explain more about their motivation as well. Yeah, so I'm a lecturer now in Manchester. Before that, I was a postdoc in Cambridge. And before that, I did PhD in psychology in Germany and um, studied electrical engineering. So that's my background. And machine learning audiology started in Cambridge on a grant for Bayesian active learning applied to what Brian Moore and Richard Turner do. Yeah, that's basically my brief background. I think I've met um, Dennis and Jan Willem at the VCCA. And uh, Joseph, anything for uh, this meeting that you would uh, like to get out of it or your motivation to join this? Yeah, I think it's a fantastic idea that you do that, Jan Willem, because we have our scientific publications, but when you write the blog, you might bring it closer to clinicians. And yeah. maybe even companies so that they finally start implementing it. Yes, um, I think that can be really something we can do with this blog. That uh, some of your papers, uh, also the conjoint analysis paper by Dennis, for instance, it's quite dense to, to read. And I think for many clinicians, yeah, if you're busy, you won't be able to, to read it and think, ah, this is something we need to bring to our clinic. Agreed. Then would you like to further Tell us something about your background. Sure. I'm currently a professor of biomedical engineering at Washington University in St. Louis. My educational background is electrical engineering, biomedical engineering, neuroscience, and medicine. I also have an MD. And my lab that I set up at WashU was a primate neurophysiology lab. So we were recording neurons in the auditory cortex and trying to understand function, you know, complex vocalization processing in a vocal primate species. And as we started doing a little bit more with humans, trying to replicate some of our um, findings, not, well, we did some electro electrode recordings, but mostly with behavioral data. We became interested in perceptual training and trying to induce therapeutic changes in, in um, brain function for improving signal detection, specifically speech processing. And as we started thinking about what uh, that, that literature, if you know that literature, is very confusing in the sense of the, the ability to achieve perceptual training effects that are persistent and transfer in any complex domain that's very spotty 
it's it depends on the lab and the preparation and it's it's not a highly reproducible set of data essentially in the field and so we started reasoning how can we optimize the uh, training trials for each person and that turns out to be a very hard problem but we stumbled across this idea of active learning for not therapeutic purposes for training but for testing and the the opportunity to speed up testing procedures really seemed to present itself with this set of tools that we were using. And that has uh, taken over what we do. So we, we're not working on training at the moment. Mm -hmm. We're not even working on monkeys anymore. Uh, we're really thinking about, and this is why I also appreciate this, the idea of a blog entry that might get things closer to clinicians. We think that now the, the way I'm contemplating this is um, I still want to get back to training but very complex latent constructs, especially that bridge perception and cognition, like speech processing, there, there, are, there, there are many points of failure in noisy speech processing that can happen mm -hmm. from, from the ear to the brain, right? And those, are, those fall in between perceptual and cognitive phenomena. And I'd like to build uh, models and testing regimes that can bridge those gaps. And the amount of data required using classical methods is just prohibited for unifying that kind of thing. So my goal nowadays is to try to extend the audiogram was just our test case that we, it turns out to be quite successful, but it was really just us showing our proving to ourselves that this approach would work and add value and also kind of giving us some background to be able to do more complex model construction. Yeah. And so that's my interest in this meeting would be exactly, you know, to, to take those ideas out and, and um, promote them as a possible future for behavioral testing in a wide variety of fields. That's cool. And also what, what, what you mentioned now, I think if I would translate it to clinicians, this inducing a change in the brain is what we do with cochlear implants. When we're starting fitting them, the big problem is that what we do during the first month really changes the brain so that you cannot just say, okay, we go back and do it again. There's like a hysteresis loop that you have made changes and people have become accustomed to something. And that's a problem I think we are not able to tackle uh, yet in the clinic. So Paul Govart from Belgium, he did this review about fitting procedures and turned out that every clinic had their own procedure. And many of these procedures turned out to be fine because the brain adapts apparently to this. So in terms of trying to relate to what clinicians experience, I think this is an example. And the other thing is that yeah, you started with the audiogram and in our scoping review, we found that the mean testing times are around five minutes for a test. So if you're talking about time efficiency, then there's not so much room for improvement. And that could also be a reason that maybe the clinicians are not yet tempted too much to adopt this. But if you show that you can combine it with other tests to speed it up and with more complex theory, that might be a stronger case. That, that might be a more succinct way of, of summarizing my interest is joining the audiogram to other relevant tests into a unified or mostly unified testing procedure mm -hmm. that integrates the data across all the tests to decide what the optimal sequence of queries is going to be. Mm -hmm. And I guess there's also a bridge to the work by Beth and uh, fitting hearing aids and the complexities their experience, I think, by clinicians. Yeah, so uh, shall I introduce myself? <laughs> yes, yes, please. Okay, Sorry. yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm, so I'm Bert de Vries. I, I work as a, a professor in uh, electrical engineering, signal processing specifically in at the Technical University in Eindhoven. I still have a, a small affiliation with GN. Uh, at the time that we wrote the, we did the work on the, the active learning for the audiogram, I worked in much larger capacity for GN than, than currently. So my interest is in designing, in basically automating the design of algorithms, right? The, the brain is not born with the capacity for speech understanding. We learn to understand speech, well, basically through spontaneous interactions with our environment. And we learn to walk and to recognize objects. There's a beautiful theory by Carl Friston on how the brain computes. It's called the free energy principle. It's a very Bayesian probabilistic theory. And my goal at my lab here at the university is to translate 
those ideas to engineering, to build agents that learn purposeful behavior just naturally through spontaneous interactions with, with the environment. That could include yeah, speech recognition or object recognition, but may also be for robots. The active learning paper, it just seemed, since my our approach in our lab is very Bayesian, it seemed this was around 2014 that I had a PhD student, Marco Cox, and, and, and in a discussion, we just figured out, well, this whole audiogram taking seems like a classification problem. You have a discrimination boundary and everything below is one class. You cannot hear it and above you mm -hmm. can hear it. So let's just build a Gaussian a Bayesian classifier for this. And, and he did. And yeah, it turned out that Dennis had the same idea around the same time, maybe even a few months earlier. <laughs> and then, so then we, 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 Marco wrote that paper and put it on archive and we found out that Dennis had basically written about the same paper. And yeah, so that's the, the, the story on, and then it took a long time. I think recently Marco made some improvements to his design with a, with a new prior and a mixture of Gaussian processes. And that's our paper in, uh, in 2021. Um, okay, yeah, Mr. Yeah. Mead, I didn't read the update yet. But no, I was also surprised about uh, you bringing up the free energy principle by by Friston. And yeah, for what I heard so far, or I tried to understand about it, was it quite complex in also using it for actual predictions. But that's or well, that's some of the critiques I think on this model. Okay, so the idea here is. That what Carl Friston says is the brain follows just the laws of physics. And the laws of physics, there is sort of an umbrella framework for describing the laws of physics. That's called the principle of least action. You can write down a function or technically a functional. And if you minimize that functional, you can derive mechanics, classical mechanics, electrodynamics, basically all the branches of physics. And you can also do this in sort of an information. You can write the information theoretic formulation of this. And then it turns into what, what we call the machine learning variational base. And he claims that's all that's going on in the brain, just following the laws of physics. It just turns out that if you write that down in an information theoretical way, then you're doing also Bayesian reasoning. So following the principle of least action in the brain leads to Bayesian reasoning, which is uh, machine learning. And so you can use it then for, yeah, for, for information processing, for designing algorithms, for all kinds of mm -hmm. stuff, for learning how to walk and learning how to hear. And the, what we do in my lab is not to verify that claim, but use it as an inspiration for engineering. I have an engineering uh, lab. Um, where the design of hearing aid algorithms and fitting of hearing aid algorithms is, is an interesting application area, but the, but the principle is broad enough to include yeah, lots of other applications. Right? You could think of self-driving cars or robots that learn to walk. In the, the key observation is that since this is like an umbrella kind of theory, it's basically a one solution method to all the problems, right? In engineering, when you start with a problem and then you go to the literature, you find 15 solutions and you modify one and now you have 16 solutions. And the brain turns that around. The brain cannot afford for every problem to come up with a new solution method. There's just one solution method. Free energy minimization or following principle of least action. One solution method that learns both the problem and its solution simultaneously. And it also scores how well the problem is represented and how well the solution solves the problem. So there is one cost function for all problems. And that's that makes it really nice also for engineering because I can apply it anywhere, including to, to audiology if you, if you want, but also to other areas. Another way to... To say this is that you apply probability theory then to the yeah. problem, or is that an oversimplification? Uh, well, it is a simplification, but it is also very accurate. And that's also, I mean, I think in, in, in essence, the three approaches by Dennis, Joseph, and, 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 and Marco, because it's mostly Marco's work, Marco Cox's mm -hmm. work, are very similar. It's all a it's Bayesian classifier for an interesting problem. You know, you know, finding an, an audiogram, but 
that framework of active learning could really is really broader, can be applied to much broader sets of problems than just to, to taking an audiogram. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think also this was one of the questions that was, yeah, Joseph, I think you had a question that the similar applications outside audiology and you also started with us. Are we constrained only to the audiogram in this uh, discussion? So I guess this question already is uh, coming up here naturally. And I guess the three of you all have your own thoughts or directions on where you are heading towards. Is an idea that you briefly mentioned these future directions you're aiming for? Or applications sure. you think are interesting? Joseph, would you start? Yeah, I can say it again. <laughs> Well, yeah, the audiogram is the sort of the ideal test bed because it's simple. It has those two dimensions. One of them is distance based. So it could be even more than one dimension, just something that gives you a distance, that's frequency. And the other dimension level and the classification problem is that monotonic dimension. So by having these two dimensions, it's the ideal test bed. And as you said, then we can put a lot of effort into it and decrease testing time from five to three minutes or even two minutes which is from a scientific point of view, exciting. From a practical point of view, it's not too much. So it's an ideal test bed, but we, we really want to use it for further tests. And within audiology, there are lots of further tests that can be done, like Dennis said, speech tests. Uh, with speech, you have the problem that you have not two variables, but many, and you have to identify which one do you want to learn. And so and we have done a similar thing with uh, the notched noise test. So in a notched noise test, you have about eight variables, signal frequency, masker frequencies, level, and so on, notch width. And eight, eight variables are too much. The curse of dimensionality just hits. And so you have to tailor that problem to reduce your variables. What we did, we reduced it to three variables, but one of them was signal frequency, which wasn't done at notched noise test before. You typically test one auditory filter at one frequency. But the huge advantage of the Bayesian active learning is, like in our audiogram approaches, when you have a continuous frequency, then suddenly you get the auditory filters across the whole hearing range. And then suddenly you have a huge advantage because testing several auditory filters at four or five frequencies takes two hours or longer. And with that active learning, you can do it in half an hour. And that's a real difference for the clinic. You can't put the patient yeah. into the booth for half an hour, but not for two, three, or four hours. And the audiologist doesn't need to, um, to be present during that half hour. Those tests are automatic. They can correct for errors because everything's probabilistic. They figure out that um, one answer is so unlikely that it was just a wrong button press. So that's the beauty of these tests. And yeah, we, we have worked for a few further tests like auditory filters, dead regions. Dead regions were without them Gaussian processes, but also Bayesian, equal loudness contours. There are probably many more to do, and I think the three groups of us will work in slightly different directions and provide many more tests. So that's great for audiology, but we should keep in mind that there is a much broader um, field of application in the whole field of healthcare, where mm -hmm. you um, ask patients questions where you do more than one test or can do more um, than one test, then you want these Bayesian approaches. For example, when you measure your blood values, then you need to take a needle. So that makes it less good as a test bed. And then you can choose um, which values you want to analyze and that costs money. So if you have a Bayesian approach that um, tells you which values are interesting to analyze the doctor's opinions, that, that sort of thing is where we as audiology could be the pioneers because we have such an easy test bed and other fields of medicine could identify where they can use our approaches and integrate it into their practice. Yeah, it's a really cool, broader perspective. And I think we'll have to also return to this in this discussion also since this is what you mentioned with pioneering, but really a paradigm change in medicine, if you would do this. And so I would like to discuss this further, but I think Bert and Dennis, you also have ideas, further applications. So Dennis, what further applications are you considering? Yeah, I'll say, I just agree with that assessment 100%. It, it, 
it's uh, this, I keep saying this in in talks, like all of those points that Joseph just made, and I think they go over most people's head. I I really believe audiology can be an example for the rep because our problems are tractable. I, I won't call them easy, but they're tractable for our, mm -hmm. these approaches, and the same kinds of approaches could be postulated in other fields. It's just harder to think how to state the problem in a way that's actually uh, solvable in the same way. Mm -hmm. So we're starting that direction for, I mentioned earlier, my interest in bridging perceptual and cognitive um, constructs. So we're starting now building cognitive models in, in the same way. And that is considerably harder than psychophysics. And it's because the, the, the feature space comes for free in psychophysics, but in um, cognitive spaces, there's no even general agreement about what the feature space, what is memory? Uh, it can only be operationally defined and everyone has their own operational definition, just to give you an example. So we're generalizing the, the principles, uh, the model construction, the active learning, and then the population level analysis I'll talk about in just a minute, to these the latent variables, we're, we're trying to generalize what we're doing to active latent variable modeling is the way to say it, I would say. And how we form these latent variable models, mm -hmm. it's not going to be as simple as pulling off the shelf kernels like we've used so far for this, this probabilistic classifier. So we're trying to figure out ways that we might do that both empirically from data and then from theoretical constraints that we can impose on the problem from other knowledge. And we're making progress, but it, it, it is so much easier to operate in perceptual space. We're still keeping projects alive there because we can make progress. And I've, the, the machine learning audiogram that I've, you know, beaten into the ground is because I, partly it is such a great model system for, and it's like the, the audiogram I think of as a, literally a model system, right? It's a use case that has a gold standard. It's got, it's the simplest complex kind of psychometric function you can postulate. And it just makes a great um, test bed for, you know, can we speed up things a factor of two, a factor of four? And if they don't work for the audiogram, I, I wouldn't spend all this effort on trying to build these more complex latent variable models. So I think the next step for me is where I think we're going to get the biggest payoff for these methods is in procedures or diagnostic paths, trajectories for disorders that are highly variable within the population. So when there's great population heterogeneity, you can't just average across big cohort. You can't just take a little data from a lot of people and then plug new patients into this population somehow and understand mm -hmm. the best way going forward. So we in audiology also realize that because every fitting procedure is at least at the cochlear implant level. And I would argue even from the hearing aid level, everything is individualized in a sense. You can't just blindly pull plans, rehab plans off the shelf and apply to everyone. So we already have this mentality that things need to be individualized. And that doesn't really exist throughout the bulk of medicine, even though the concept of precision medicine is all about adapting your therapies to the individual, it's just not being thought about in the same way as we in rehabilitation, we think about it. So my goal is to expand these tools into a space where we can conceptualize more complex latent constructs in brain and behavior. So I'm, I'm not going to leave brain and behavior because I think there's plenty of space, plenty of work to be done there, but I want to use all of these as templates for the rest of medicine to say, oh, these active learning procedures are, are really useful when you have highly variable manifestations of disease and we can uh, reduce the amount of data that we need to collect from each person to make a diagnosis for them and then ultimately decide on the optimal treatment. And it could vary. You might, uh, these methods might ultimately lead to a rational selection of completely individualized treatments for each individual. And without having, you know, the way that clinical trials work is you give a cohort an intervention and uh, if it works, then the, the range at which that intervention is deemed to be relevant is who was in that cohort. So we're trying to break out of this population or cohort level rules of inference and bring in the, the formal ability 
to infer across a variation mm -hmm. in, in in populations and still pick the best choice for them. And I think these yeah. Bayesian methods are ideal for that. Well, uh, I think uh, Joseph just explained a, a paradigm change that we need, but you also now uh, run into the same problem, I would say that, for instance, these cohort studies also to get FDA approval or a CAE marking, you need to test something on a group. And as clinician, I should say that often we just have a single solution for hearing aids, there's a prescription rule and you more or less, it's a one size fits all you give to almost everybody. And sometimes there's some tweaking, but then you run into a really gray zone that you don't really know what you're doing. And it's based on previous experience but I think if you ask clinicians their fair assessment of how certain they are or what they are doing, it's probably either trial or error or something that they've done before and it worked on that particular uh, patient. So they tr just try it again. And that's also sometimes I think what for the clinicians is their reason to be like, this is really where they excel like, oh, I know this experience from the cohort. This person is really different. And together, you know, the patient then will look for a decent solution. Or if you give up after a couple of trials, you say, okay, now we start to counsel on how to cope with this limitation that we cannot solve. And I think what you propose would help the clinician in this search, but it's also a, a leap of faith in the sense that would I as clinician also be able to understand the procedures that I'm following then? Or is it kind of black box that's providing me uh, advice? And would a clinician still be needed? Or is it better that the algorithm directly interacts with the patients, for instance? My brief answer is I absolutely believe clinicians always needed. Clinician and patient and, and maybe supporting family need to be involved in the decisions. The, the Bayesian methods can provide guidance and suggestions, mm -hmm. but they, they don't provide value, right? They, they, they can't, I mean, you can define a cost function, but the, that's outside the scope of the algorithm, right? It has to be defined mm -hmm. by the people involved. And so these are clinical decision support tools. And that's the yeah. right, that's the terminology within yeah. AI and medicine. And that's the right terminology here. They're here to for very complex scenarios where the human brain doesn't log conditional probabilities well, which we don't do very well, you, you rely on the algorithm to compute those things and then evaluate at the outcomes level, essentially. Mm -hmm. So then for working out this interview, it's important that we stress that point of why the clinicians are needed, but also what change in mindset or approach for clinicians is needed and how to get them curious to do this and what I maybe can add here is that for the website, we see a lot of people from all over the globe visiting the website, also from many countries in Af Africa or Asia. And I think that there is curiosity, uh, but also fear in the sense of, so, so for instance, an audiology trainer who was a little bit depressed that she told me that, or she shared on LinkedIn that many of the students were uncertain what kind of job they would get. And she actually made a call. Could you please share positive experiences of how your job can develop and the opportunity? So it's more or less on my to-do list to say there's a lot of things that you can explore to improve your clinical care. And we just wrote this Wikipedia article about computational audiology. And what I like about it is that I learned that my one sentence summary would be translating models into clinical care. And I think also with Berto Fries, uh, two years ago already in this discussion, he said that it's a model-based approach, but this translating into clinical care, yeah, it's of course really important that clinicians there are involved and, and see the potential. You know, Jan Willem, I have a suggestion actually, because I have had, I believe five audiology students come through my lab and publish papers with me, including that very first paper. So maybe, it, and, and I have found that the younger, the, the students are very interested in this technology and it's the older practitioners that are the most skeptical. So it might be interesting to interview students who have worked with these automated 
and or machine learning based methods mm -hmm. and get some of those interviews up on the website. Yeah. I think that could be interesting. Yeah, that's a good idea. Then let's continue with this question to you, uh, Bert, especially since I think we are making this application space bigger and bigger and probably what you mentioned already what your lab is doing. It's the biggest space more or less. So how would you define the applications and, and how to use the scope of yeah, maybe medicine then if you say uh, audiology is maybe some kind of example case, but the real benefit will be when you do this in, in medicine at large or society at large. I mean, I first, I, I completely side with what Joseph and, and Dennis have said, right? I'm not an audiologist. We are all three by training originally electrical engineers. So you need to keep that also in mind, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So we have a very computational view on this whole field and that may not be the the best for, I mean, Dennis is also a, a physician, so that's, <laughs> he's maybe different, but so in my view, I mean, just, I have a few comments also about what I just heard. It's important to remember that I mean, if the audiogram just tries to estimate the hearing threshold, but the hearing threshold is not something physical in your brain. It's a variable in a model. It's just a variable in a model that we write down, right? And with that model, we can take the model we can predict if we give a stimulus to a user, will he answer or not? Yeah. And all the Bayesian method does is well, it, 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 it provides a framework for estimating that variable. But the Bayesian framework is broader, right? It can estimate any kind of variable. So my interest, the next step would be, oh, let's estimate more parameters in the hearing aid algorithm. And in my lab, we are really interested in using the Bayesian approach. So not just estimate the parameters fitting, but just estimate or derive the whole algorithm. Let's just derive the whole hearing aid algorithm. So that's a long-term ambition that will mm -hmm. take years and, and, and we'll see how far we get. But in principle, there's nothing that would stop us from, from, from doing that. Having said that, there is nothing that we do here. We never see a patient, <laughs> right? It's sort of an isolated exercise here that we hope at some point clinicians can use and take to their patients, right? I mean, none of my students will ever see a, a hearing aid patient. We have no idea about how to deal with a hearing aid patient. We do technical work. It's very interesting. And I think there is a chance that with the, the work that we do, that as you just move about and you interact with an agent, which say, oh, I like what I'm hearing. I don't like what I'm hearing. That over time, yeah. we can design a hearing aid algorithm how that is used by a clinician who is talking to his patient is, is a completely different profession. So my advice would be for audiologists and clinicians, try to stay interested in what happens on the technical side. I mean, you don't have to know the details about Bayesian inference, but Bayesian inference is an important growing field. It's really interesting to learn something about it. I mean, there's a reason why we all three are so enthusiastic about it. Mm -hmm. it. And it's very important also for, I think, for audiology. And just and reinvent yourself. Uh, and I would say the same thing to signal processing engineers in the hearing industry. Because if this works, if we build agents that design algorithms, then what do we do with the signal processing engineers? So yeah, yeah. it's not a problem just, it's a problem for, for all of us and also mm -hmm. for myself. <laughs> Um, but so we all have this problem, I think, yeah, of, of a bit of anxiety about the future, already. and probably the soup will not be eaten as hot at this, uh, at this, as it's served. So well, let's calm it down. Me of one of my favorite quotes, actually, never have no fear. It's from the movie. It's very fun to, to watch about uh, a family in the uh, Stone Age uh, living, and they are afraid for anything. But what you're saying now is, I think... Maybe people reading about your work would think, ah, okay, I need to find a faster way to get to the thresholds. But the reason in the first time we were measuring thresholds is that it's too complex to measure responses of people to all sounds, because that I think you would want to do, optimize how people hear any sound. But instead we were able to measure thresholds and then use the half gain rule, more or less how much gain 
amplification of sound we could provide our patients. And I think we have even forgotten about uh, the ideal of making any sound audible. And another thing maybe that you are now touching upon is how to get to ecologically valid assessments. Because what we do is measuring in a sound booth, uh, really artificial sounds, only pure tones or maybe warbles, while you would like to know how people are actually hearing in their daily lives and how to optimize it in that situation. So that's also, of course also really close to the hearing aid fittings, I think, in uh, optimized situations. Yeah, yeah, no, I think eventually, eventually, I think most of hearing aid fitting should take place in the field where the problems happen, right? Yeah, I mean, you don't want to fit anything until you have a problem and then, then you solve the problem and you move on and you solve the next mm -hmm. problem and you move on. And this is sort of how we bumble through life. And I think it's also how we should teach our hearing aids how to behave. So, and in principle, you don't need a hearing threshold. Let's say you don't need in principle pure tone audiometry to estimate the hearing threshold. You can, if it's a variable in your model and you, then it's just a latent variable and Bayesian methods. If you get responses from patients to other stimuli, you may also be able to estimate that hearing threshold. And maybe you will find out that in, in order to listen well to sounds, we don't even need a very accurate hearing threshold. Other parameters may be more mm -hmm. important, right? So the hard focus on getting the most accurate hearing threshold is something I think that will, uh, will over time be less important. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure if, if the others agree with that, but that's how I feel about that. Uh, I'm not I'll, sure. I'll just say, yeah, can I say quickly, I agree, and I, I have focused a lot on these hearing thresholds with the audiogram, but I view that as a proving grounds, right, yeah. for being able to yeah. incorporate more interesting latent variables. I would love to eliminate the sound booth entirely because of the ecological validity question, mm -hmm. right? That just, yeah. Um, yeah. It, yeah. It's, yeah. it's got issues there. I agree, I agree. And I think maybe one of you also wrote it in the answers already. I guess we clinicians also have a term, the hidden hearing loss, which shows that we, we cannot measure this, but when we would use active learning, I guess we will be better able to pinpoint these cases of hidden hearing loss uh, where we don't have the sensitivity to detect hearing difficulties and that we have this difference between what the uh, patient reports in problems and what we measure in our sound booth. I think in terms of time, one of the challenges was that you could also, of course, ask each other questions. So we make a round of questions to uh, one another. Dennis, do you have a question for Joseph, for instance? Well, my, my original questions were origin story questions, like how all, everyone in this group kind of got into this mode of thinking, but what I've already taken away is that I think from slightly different perspectives, but maybe not so different since I didn't realize we were all trained in electrical engineering and signal processing. I mean, that's, I considered myself a signal processing um, engineer, I guess, for it's why I got into auditory work at, at the very beginning and then ultimately into the neurobiology of hearing later. But I, I feel like I've, I know that better now. So it's, there's some uniquenesses, but I, I think we're integrating other ideas out in other fields and taking them to the space. And that, I, I guess I just have a comment that was interesting to hear. And I would have asked that question if I didn't feel like I got a pretty good sense of it already. But maybe another question then, or, or Joseph, do you have a question you, you want to ask Bert or uh, Dennis? Shown all their future plans and use cases in great detail and I just agree with all the motivations and as a comment I mean our approaches are a bit different especially with the future plans I mean Bert's approach is big data and with that free energy and variational base that's a very interesting area because he can handle many more responses much more data with um, those approaches and I think that variational base has not been done too much so far in our applied Bayesian active learning field. So I think that's a very interesting work that he's doing. Oh well, yeah, and I also say that I was a surprise that there's a lot of alignment between the three of you in 
well, of course, for the approach, is that not a surprise, but also in um, maybe you should have uh, invited another person or uh, clinicians to get this better, this contrast on uh, what's used in practice and what new tools are, are developed. So your ideas of maybe also doing some interviews with clinicians, uh, I'll, I'll think about it. And what I also wanted to share is that in November, there was a reading group about computational audiology, which was initiated by a lecturer in audiology from Texas. So she was interested in machine learning in her field. And so she contacted me in, uh, I think, October and we put it on the website. And then I think eight people responded and followed the same course on Coursera about artificial intelligence. And the eight of them had discussions on Sunday, every morning, Sunday morning in that month. And yeah, that were really nice discussions. We, uh, they were done in, in Slack and uh, people were just typing in their responses and thoughts about these, um, lessons. And uh, she had prepared always two or three questions for the week based on the, the course that with the whole group was seen more or less in the same time frame. So there's, uh, I could start with asking them yeah, their, their thoughts of how they uh, tend to use these ideas into either uh, clinical training or in uh, clinical work. Uh, and it shows that it's maybe still a tiny group, but there's uh, uh, people really uh, curious about these new methods. Other things you want to share or otherwise we can sign off uh, nice in time. Um, actually, I do have a question maybe for everyone. It's interesting. I think that the three of us have converged in this particular space in, I would say hearing science. Have you, have any of you seen similar work going on in other fields that that's parallel? And I can say in vision, we just got a grant to do the same thing in a vision test. There are Bayesian methods that have been used in, in other psychophysical domains, but this exact kind of approach that we're taking, I just haven't seen elsewhere. I'm wondering if you guys have seen that, that kind of thing. And not, not for a very long time. I mean, there's that paper in 1999, Konsevich and Tyler, who did that vision thing, mm -hmm. right. who basically said that we are doing it that way, which we are doing now, but with the computation of the 1990s, so much simpler. But yeah, after that, I haven't seen too much in, in that field. Out of personal interest, I tried to reach out to rare diseases and autoimmune diseases but so far without success. So I attend those sandpits at my university at other UK universities. I think in, in, in most fields, there is a sub-community of Bayes, say Bayesian scientists or engineers who try to approach the classical problems in their field from a Bayesian viewpoint. Like for me, I got interested in a Bayesian approach around early 2000s, like 2001 or two, I'm not so sure, by reading articles from these theoretical physicists who were applying it in cosmology, because in, in astrophysics, experiments are extremely expensive there, so they have to do active learning. They have to make sure that their experiments are informative. And, and then I thought, well, we work with people, you know, our experiments have to also be informative. So, mm -hmm. so that, that, that made sense. And, and since then I started working on Bayesian methods and after an initial, uh, maybe it took like two years for me to realize that, wow, this approach covers basically the whole scientific uh, mm -hmm. endeavor, right? Bayesian approach is basically a description of science. It, it should be part of every field. And in every field, there's a subgroup of people working on this. Also now in so for hearing aids, but I think in almost every community and some communities a little bigger a group and other communities are very small, but I would encourage people to, to study it. And the papers that we wrote, I mean, it doesn't matter whether you read, I think Joseph's paper or Marco's paper or uh, Dennis paper, it's a good test case. It's a very clean problem. If you, I've studied a little bit of Bayesian material and you can read, and then you can actually say, okay, can I read the paper Joseph wrote or the paper that Dennis mm -hmm. wrote? It's a very nice, because if you can, and you can actually understand that paper, you will start to see, oh, but now I can apply this 
yeah. everywhere. These Gaussian processes, they are actually, I think it may, be, it may come from the group that uh, where Joseph used to work, Richard Turner. I mean, he applies them everywhere. I think they even put them on the web and you can pay money and they will optimize your, your optimization problem and solve your optimization problem. So they are applied almost everywhere now. Yeah, but it's still in every field, a very small subgroup of people. Sounds um, a good example from Neil in Cambridge, who had that paper in 2011 about Gaussian processes and active learning, which interestingly wasn't published, but has several hundred citations. I think the machine learning world was skeptical at the time about that. If, if you read it with the audiological view, then the whole paper seems like, okay, you can use it for the audiogram, but um, then um, they needed a few more years until Dennis was really the first to publish that and say, yeah, this is an audiogram. This has an application. This is not just machine learning toy stuff um, in some yeah. fancy mathematical world. So a huge credit to Dennis and mm -hmm. Will Burton um, at the same time. Um, yeah, my, uh, just going back to Bert's statement, I, my favorite quote in this space is, no Bayesians are born, they're all converted. So, so it's like uh, most of the people who are, are real Bayesianists that I have worked with have some kind of epiphany story. They, they've been scientists yeah. and they stumble across this literature and realize, oh, this describes exactly how I think about these things and no one ever taught it to me. So it just reminded me of that. And and I, I do agree, there, there are Bayesianists operating in these different spaces, but the, the, the combination of Bayesianism and the exact models that we're using and the treatment of uh, these psychophysical tasks as classification problems to solve and the types of models, that kind of conglomeration together, which is where the power, the full power of these techniques emerge. It's still, I think we're leaders. That, that's my conclusion at this stage is our field is leading the charge because I'm not seeing it, at least at this degree in other spaces. Mm -hmm. Wow, I really like this. So uh, what I, want to ask you, maybe it's good if the three of you share your favorite quotes that we will put this in the blog. Also, when I thought I put it in the chat, these resources that since we have been discussing a little bit using this in medicine at large, it's important that people start to get an intuition and use cases and can play around with it. So on this website with the resources, so far we've collected tools, models that can be used for remote audiology or for research uh, purposes. So if you have something that you are uh, free to share, yeah, please consider it. So there's a lot of different ways we could share it uh, at this website. Thanks a lot, Jan Willem. It was really uh, a great initiative. I really enjoyed it. Thank you also, uh, Dennis and Joseph. It was really good to meet you. Mm -hmm. Agreed. This was fun. I agree. Thanks, Jan. It was really great. Thank you for listening to the first episode of the Computational Audiology Network podcast. Guests Dennis Barber, Joseph Schlittenletcher, and Bert de Vries. Podcast soundbite design Steve Tade and Jan Willem Walsman. With contributions and help from Mark van Wonderwitz, Bas van Dijk, Enrico Miglerini, Duet Swanepoel, Alan Archer Boyd, Dennis Barber, and L. O'Brien. Podcast production and host. Jen Willem Wasman. Yeah.